Good afternoon. Before we begin, I want to remind the committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct at meetings. This includes commenting on specific agenda items only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in conversation with the chair, other council members, or staff. And all members of the committee, staff, and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Failure to comply with a code of conduct that disturbs, disrupts, or impedes the orderly conduct of this meeting will result in removal from the meeting. And with that, we can call the meeting of the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee to order. Will the clerk call the roll, please? Davis? Here. Ortiz? Present. Doan? Here. Torres? And Gandelas? Present. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, one item on our item B, review of the work plan. The Police Activities League status report is recommended or has been dropped by the Rules and Open Government Committee. Do we need a motion for that? Okay. It's, oh, sorry, yep. uh, Chair, um, I, I believe somebody from the audience was here to speak on the item. Okay. So uh, I don't know how you want to approach that. I'll just, I just did one flag that real quick. Sure, thank yeah. you. Of course. We can take public comment on the work plan item. Danny? Thank you, thank you very much, Councilwoman Davis. Honorable board, uh, my name is Danny Garza. I understand that Powell Stadium has some issues and I would like to volunteer my services to, uh, to Powell Stadium. I'd like to be a board member. If they need the director, let's, let's try that too. If, if no one else more capable than I is available. And uh, my heart is there. I played baseball there. I played semi-pro for Bonetti Sporting Goods. And uh, we played from Union City and Redwood City to Monterey. So that place is really special to me. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will go to the Zoom speakers next. Thank you. Paul? Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I want to talk about Powell Stadium's history. Powell Stadium was created, and this is an equity issue, because Powell Stadium was created when they put, when they literally demolished Sasi Puedes, and a lot of people were displaced. A lot of people from my community, remember my father is from, I, I trace my legacy and descendancy from Sasi Puedes. And so they demolished that neighborhood and they demolished the horseshoe. They split the horseshoe in two. And so there was a lot of displacement associated with that. And that is in one of the ways in which the city um, at least made an attempt to amend that was by creating Pell Stadium. So that's number one. That has to be centered within the context of this conversation when you're and, and have that history guide your decisions. I don't think that that has been properly contextualized, Danny Garza, his father is the first Chicano ever to legislate policy on behalf of the Chicano community since 1846. Really? He was elected by Norman Mineta in 1971. And this is the legacy that he represents. This is, this is, and that's why I fully support what it is that he's doing in our community and I respect what he's doing in our community and I respect what his father represented to my community, both then and now. So I'm respectfully submitting to you that this history be properly contextualized, not, not rhetorically, but actually concretely, so that the people whose lives have been most affected and impacted by institutionalized racism we got to 215. is at least in some ways amended by the city and that the city acknowledged that. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will move on to item D. There are no items on the consent calendar, so item D is reports to committee. And the first item is San Jose Youth Empowerment Alliance. And all right, hi. Take it away, please. So we are short. Uh, two of our presenters, excuse me, hi, Chair hi. Um, Davis. Um, so we would be happy to swap with the summer. Um, Okay. The summer program report? Okay. Okay. 
Do we, if Thanks. we need to do that, are Maria and Vidya here? So let's move to item two, the 2023 summer program status report. We'll take these items out of order. Okay then, uh, my name is Maria De Leon and I'm Deputy Director of the Recreation Division. Uh, next to me is my colleague, uh, Vidya Kilambi. She's a Division Manager with the Library. And we're both very excited to show off our dynamic camps, classes, and activities planned for this summer by both departments. So we'll begin with PRNS programming and then transition to the library efforts. Next slide. Next slide. Is that doing it? Okay. Uh, just press the digital. Okay. So what, what you see in front of you is, is a map that illustrates all of PRNS's summer programs and locations which cover our Camp San Jose, Camp San Jose Junior, our FIT camps, our aquatic programming, teen centers, uh, our summer food service programs, as well as our regional parks. So if you can see that this map illustrates that we have camps located throughout San Jose and across all city council districts. So we will be operating full and half day uh, summer camps out of 10 hub centers and six regional parks. Uh, summer is our busiest season. Uh, our program uh, supports uh, working families uh, that are, whose children are out of school, so we're always on the go, especially during the summer. We hire an average of around 300 summer employees annually, and we begin recruiting in the beginning of the year, which is in January. So our aquatic program operates four pools citywide, which are Camden, Fair, Swim Center, Mayfair, and Ryland. And then we have two pools that we contract out with uh, Ant Swim School at Alviso and Bebrock. So we provide a variety of swim lessons for all ages, ranging from toddlers to adults. In addition uh, to our swim lessons, which are very popular, uh, Recreation Swim is available uh, to the community after our swim lessons. It's usually in the early afternoon, typically from 2 to 4.30, and Saturdays mostly from 2.30 to 5. So... Pierna staff were intentional to ensure all children and youth can participate in public recreation opportunities, whether they could afford it or not, through various efforts. Uh, next are some examples. So we have our priority registration, which was established primarily targeting our scholarship eligible families. Uh, this year it began on Wednesday, February 15th through Friday, February 24th. And during this short period of time, PRNS distributed approximately $1,029,686 in scholarship support to approximately 572 participants, with uh, $1.698 million available this summer. Um, PRNS team also increased our marketing efforts, amplifying outreach to our opportunity neighborhoods. Uh, Staff also set up mobile registration and application assistance for families to enroll in our programs and scholarships off-site so the community did not have to go to our community center to register. We went out to them where they were at. Uh, we also developed multilingual marketing and outreach campaigns for summer programs in four different languages. We also collaborated with Project Hope um, and coordinated uh, recruitment efforts during uh, their events, like litter pickups, second harvest meal distribution, and district dumpster days. And additionally, to ensure uh, youth living in Project Hope sites completed the application process for summer, to being uh, hired for our summer programs, uh, Pierna staff held a clinic at Mayford Community Center to provide technical assistance with the application process. So also, uh, as previously presented, well, 
it wasn't previously presented because we, we came first. The Safe Summer um, uh, Initiative Grant is funded out of the San Jose Youth Empowerment Alliance and it is intended to provide recreation and educational opportunities not normally available uh, to youth serve through the Alliance. So services are provided by our nonprofit partners from June and August, also during the summer months on an annual basis. So this summer, 360,728 was awarded to 28 agencies to do just that. So PRNS has a scholarship program to help qualifying families with their registration fees. So during uh, pre-COVID, before uh, COVID, so pre-COVID scholarships were utilized to reduce fees for mostly 75% no, of most programs. So leaving a family responsible for payment of the remaining uh, program fees. So they would end up paying the remaining 25% uh, of a registration fee with the 75% covered by scholarships. But to some families that was still a barrier uh, to participate and some of them just didn't or weren't able to afford to. But utilizing the temporary ARP funding, uh, PRNS was able to designate funds to provide low-income families with 100% of scholarship support. So as a result, uh, more families were able to participate. Um, unfortunately, once ARP scholarship supports runs out, as it will, uh, we suspect that the uh, recreation participation levels will be uh, negatively impacted. So what you'll see is like the next two slides, this one and the next one, is a comparison of scholarships prior to COVID versus scholarships utilization uh, using ARP funding. So in, in fiscal year 18-19, PRNS had um, an annual scholarship allocation of around 885,000 spread throughout multiple programs, benefiting approximately 2,000 2, children and youth. So, the table on the right provides an example of program fees and the amount that was owed by the customer after receiving the scholarship. So in fiscal year 22-23, which was last year with ARP support, PRNS was able to distribute $3.2 million in scholarship funding serving over 3,000 youth. So the increase in available funding not only enabled more youth to participate, but also eliminated all fees, all registration fees for scholarship eligible families. So ARP funding greatly benefited uh, families, those most in need, uh, increasing access and eliminating the barrier of cost to quality childcare programs offered by PRNS, which is extremely important, especially to support working families. PRNS recognizes that the hardship that will return to families when ARP uh, fundings and support are exhausted and has advanced a budget proposal that will continue the scholarship and staffing levels that were established through the pandemic. Now I'll pass it on to Ms. Vidya. Thank you, Lee. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Vidya Kilambi, division manager with the library, and thank you for this opportunity to present on the library summer programs. Summer Learning is the cornerstone of the Library Summer Program offerings and is an eight-week literacy initiative that runs June 1st to July 31st and offers participants incentives for reading and learning. This year, as in previous years, we'll be partnering with PRNS summer camps, school and local education agencies, early child care centers, and bridge libraries. Participants can sign up at sjpl.org slash summer or also stop by any branch to sign up in person. This program provides an opportunity for children and teens to prevent summer learning loss and be better prepared for the following school year. This early education summer, summer learning program is part of the library's broader effort to support children ages zero to five and their caregivers, program participants, preschools and daycare sites throughout San Jose will receive educational materials and books for each child in their care to support quality early learning opportunities in both formal and informal early learning settings. This year's program is centered around the book, Be a Maker by Katie House, will inspire creativity and construction and bring out the inner engineer in all children as they discover different ways to build and create. 
the library's early education unit is also working closely with Santa Clara County's Public Health Department to support the children's outdoor Bill of Rights through several summer community play dates designed to get kids out and about and learn more about their community, explore natural elements, and play in safe spaces. This summer, we have a variety of programs for um, school age students, and I would like to highlight five programs. Coding 5K is a digital literacy initiative bringing tech skills to local youth, and this summer we will be hosting eight summer camps, six of them in person and two virtually. Read, Write, Discover is designed to build literacy confidence in youth through summer tutoring in reading and writing, and we will be hosted at five locations this summer. SJ Learns is a grant program that works year round to help close the achievement gap in San Jose schools. This summer, SJ Learns funds are supporting programs at the Alum Rock, Franklin McKinley, and Luther Burbank School Districts, and will be serving 600 students. Teen HQ is excited to announce our partnership with We Thrive. We Thrive is a nonprofit entrepreneurial uh, apprenticeship program specifically for youth that focuses on um, helping them start their own ventures, earn real revenues, and gain mentorship. Teens can receive up to $50 in seed money for supplies. Um, additional information for this program is um, available on our website, sjpl.org slash teenhq. Um, and this summer, last but not least, we are also hosting teen interns. This is a collaborative program with Work to Future and PRNS, and interns will be assisting with various library programs, shelving of books, DVDs, and generally having a good time at the library this summer. Next. With 30% of youth in Santa Clara County living in food insecure households, many school districts in San Jose will be offering free lunches this summer. This year, SJPL will host pop-up libraries uh, to provide focused outreach to schools and community partners who will be providing free lunches. 13 of our branches listed on the sides uh, will be participating, and funding for this is made possible by a grant from the California State Government distributed by the California State Library. The 15th annual um, graphic novel making contest will be held from June 1st through July 31st this year. Authors, illustrators in four age groups are encouraged to create their own eight-page comic book. And um, the award ceremony will be ha um, held at the Seven Trees Community Center on September 9th from 2 to 4 p.m. I would like to extend an invitation to all of you to please attend, if possible, the award ceremony. Um, next slide. And this concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, we are available to answer them. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go to members of the public first. Paul. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I'm very concerned about the ARP funds. This is funds that they kind of kicked it to you guys. So I, I know this has nothing to do with you. There's some members on this committee that were here, there's some that weren't. But what the last council did is made sure that they funded these and then they kicked it to this administration to kind of struggle with how do we, uh, you know, how do we keep to maintain these? And we shouldn't be put in that position. That in itself is an equity issue. We, we are going to get there, people. I am going to guide you. We are going to get there as a city in institutionalizing racial equity to combat the racial inequity that we have experienced over generations. And we will get there. And this is one of the ways that we do this, is that we institutionalize these policies and draw it from the general fund. Stop stop funding these. We need somebody with some courage. We need somebody with some ganas that will challenge the system that we can no longer decline to fund these programs with these kind of grant allocations. They must start coming out of the general fund and be institutionalized to where these are done without question. This is the institutionalization of racial equity. Now, the nonprofit system keeps funneling this money out of the system because they're never challenging the system to change itself because they're too busy profiting from it. And, and it's, it, you know, as long as, the, as long as the poverty exists in the community, they're going to be getting fat checks from the government. The expense of these, they use what's happening with these kids in order to monetize these, these situations. It's, it's really disgusting is what it is. And I want, it, I want it to stop. 
So what I'm asking is to please start institutionalizing it and stop behaving as if you are racist and you're completely against it. Back to the committee. Thank you. Councilman Bartiz. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. I really want to thank staff uh, for putting together this uh, very informative uh, report. I'm truly um, uh, grateful to see this amount of coordination and investment in the youth and families of the city of, of San Jose. Uh, many of our you know, working class families you know, visit these programs, benefit from libraries, community centers, summer programs, and as we know, when these kind of uh, uh, services aren't being offered, that's when you know individuals may go down the wrong path. You know this keeps individuals busy, engaged, and learning over the summer, where you know a major uh, learning loss is, is occurred. So, just really want to uh, uh, thank you for this this effort. I, I do have a question. Um, someone someone had told me a, a staff member told me that uh, in previous years there was priority given to youth and families that lived in Project Hope areas. Is that still something that we um, uh, use as a metric here? So I, I started a few years ago, so I'm not sure exactly what was done before, mm -hmm. but um, the, the examples that I gave to you that were intentional, that I mentioned in the, uh, the presentation, um, a lot of that benefits the Project Hope uh, families particularly the early registration. Uh, our staff goes out to Project Hope events to ensure that our popular summer camps, this, I'm gonna give you an example, our summer camps that are all day, uh, and as well as our after school programs, um, that those slots um, are, are designated to or filled by families who most likely couldn't afford it. So we go out to the sites and particularly Project Hope areas and coordinate with the Project Hope sites to see if we could encourage them to submit uh, applications and assist them with the registration efforts so that they get those slots uh, first. Thank you, mm -hmm. I, I, I really appreciate that because you know, as, as you know, especially in Project Hope neighborhoods, there's a lot of distractions. You know, I'm getting news in my own district that youth are unfortunately getting recruited to gangs and you know I myself was a gang member so I don't judge them but these alternatives are essential for for our family so I, I really thank that and I, I appreciate the the um, preemptiveness and work that's done to make sure that these programs are accessible to our our families in um, gang impacted and crime impacted neighborhoods thank you I also want to mention that um the employment assistance is what we also, not only just the programs, but we encourage them to apply and help folks through the employment process so that if we give folks jobs, these teams jobs, they will, uh, you know, they, they'll be busy as well and also um, be part of our PRNS family, which is what we want. Thank you, Councilmember Torres. Great, thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for your for your work and the presentation. It's uh, uh, truly a uh, blessing to hear that uh, we are gonna have summer activities for our youth, which is super important, obviously. Uh, so I, I wanna piggyback off what you just mentioned. I'm now a council member, but I started with the city as a, as a rec leader as in the PRNS department. Uh, and so I think it's very important uh, that we have youth from our under-resourced communities to be working with us. Uh, how much? How many folks? Uh, how many? How many youth do we can we hire within um, within our PRNS and our library for San Jose uh, works? Um, in terms of summer, we average about 300 for seasonal employees, but we also have uh, opportunities to work with us part time. Um, and full-time even during year-round, depending on right. vacancies. So um, in terms of seasonal, we hire around 300. Year-round, it just depends on the, the vacancies that we have available at that time. I'll pass oh, it on to Vivian. Three, 300 for PRNS and the library, or 300 three, for 300 the whole program? 300 just for PRNS. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. 
for, those are part-time seasonal employees. Great. The rest are year-round, and oftentimes what we do is um, we, we request or ask the folks that are, uh, we hire during the summer if they're interested in staying on um, and working year-round for us, and that's how we often uh, fill our gaps Great. for year-round. Uh, I would, and we could, this could be offline, but I, I would love to see how many, how many youth um, are, are hired within this, uh, these departments, because uh, as you may know, uh, our council is dealing with the almost seven, the number fluctuates, but 700 to 900, uh, you know, vacancy rate and within our departments, and so I think it's important to know uh, how many youth are, you know, being, are working in our PRNS and the library department and so forth and so forth. Uh, I saw Israel, hi. Hi, Councilman Martorez. So for recreation, we have about 40 youth that are gonna be placed from San Jose Works specifically, oh, about 40 youth. And generally speaking, the, all the community centers take about two to three youth each. And we don't want too many youth, right, in each of the centers because what we really want is there to be an intentional uh, and capacity uh, issue, uh, wise. So we wanna make sure that the youth are getting the attention that they need rather than having too many youth in a community center and then not having the actual, the community center is not having the capacity to actually handle that number of youth that, we, uh, if, that come from our programs. In addition to that, the library has been, at incre both programs have been incredibly, um, uh, incredible partners to us. The libraries from the very beginning and recreation from the very beginning opened their doors to the youth uh, that we serve and this year they're gonna serve about 25 uh, youth that will be at all of the libraries. And quite frankly, you know, it's a good thing to see all the time because I show up at the libraries and they, they are working with the librarians. And it's an amazing experience for them that they've never had, right? Because some, some of these youth actually don't even go to the libraries. And now they're actually yeah. working in the libraries and learning from like some pretty good mentors that they have and folks that really care about them. Great, uh, and I think that's all I have, and I just, um, I'll move approval. I was, I'm sorry for being a little bit late. This, I move approval for D2, right? I, okay, good. <laughs> move approval for D2. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Council Member Dwan. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, staff, um, John Cicerelli and Jill, and all the staff, and perhaps even all the volunteers who got together and put these programs for our youth. Um, I just got a few questions. Um, that the priority registration, do you have continual registration, even those family who are, you know, didn't find out about the program and, and just trying to get on to the program at this point? Yes, so we have, uh, I believe, four seasons in the activity guide. So each season we uh, give, we have set aside, it's, it's a permanent thing now, right? It's a permanent effort. Mm -hmm. uh, for a specific, set aside for scholarship eligible families to register, uh, the opportunity to register 10 days before the general public does. So yes, it's, it's a permanent effort and it's spread throughout the year um, and the days are dependent on our um, seasons. Thank, thank you seasons. and a second question I have is, we have the ARP funding for now and I know that, um, you know, it's, it's um, completely supplement all of our customers, if you will, and families. When that funding is, is no longer there, are you searching for other funding on the outside in order to supplement that? So we have requested, uh, put in a budget document for, uh, um, but for funding support. I think um, ongoing, we have, uh, I believe, around 800,000 annually that is set aside uh, for, the, for the general fund. Um, we also have, um, I believe it was this past year where we had um, a, a credit union or a private entity that, that provided funds and uh, specific for the scholarship program. So we're always open and looking for opportunities uh, for external agencies to support our scholarship programs. Well, thank you for looking, keep continuing to looking for more funding and uh, big shout out for PRNS. Thank you. And libraries. And libraries. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Kandewas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
Yeah, I, I too want to echo my appreciation, Maria Vidya. Thank you for the presentation. It was, uh, it's exciting to see what kind of program we're going to do for, for, for our students this summer or for our kids or for our youth. Um, I, so I got a question on, on the capacity. You know, for Camp San Jose, you know, the figure, figure two in the memo, um, you know, we have a capacity of, you know, 6,000, 1,600, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what is the percentage that, that we fill to that capacity? Do we, you know, do we have, do we ever have like, you know, drop offs as the summer rolls out? Like, you know, do we, are we ever a hundred percent? I mean, it's probably unlikely, but you know, what, where does it look like? Do we, do we have an idea of how, how, uh, not popular, but how, um, engaged our, or how many students or youth we, we, we capture with our programming of the capacity that we're able to provide? So we do track, we do track capacity, you know, after the, the camp so that we, then we could have a more legitimate, um, confirmed amount of how many uh, camps were actually full. Right now, if, if, if not 90%, we're, we're going on anywhere between 95% and 100% full of all of our summer camps. And so um, that really has to do with the ARP funding support. You know, uh, the last two years we've had uh, uptick in, in participation levels in our summer camps and our programs and our after school programs, you know, after uh, year round because of the increase of scholarship support with the registration levels. And so when, you, when, when that is available, our numbers go up. And it's usually, to, uh, it, it's usually families who traditionally couldn't afford it, not even the 25% um, that are now taking part of it. And it has to do also with our staff being intentional in conducting outreach efforts where in the past we really didn't have to do that. And we wanted to make sure that the families that needed, needed it the most, this support, mostly working families, had accessibility and knew about the scholarship programs um, so that they could take part in it. And maybe in the past that wasn't the case. Oh, wonderful. And then, so, as, as, so I guess I got a process question. If, if we see that we have, you know, capacity left in a summer camp the following week, the week after, because obviously we have registrations ahead of time, what kind of recruitment do we do as a process, just generally speaking, to, to you know, get to that 95 if we see, we, you know, we're only like at 60, 70 percent? What, what kind of recruitment, how do, we, how do we fill slots, basically? So each, I believe that uh, the slots are paid by week, you know, that, that they're filled by week. We have waiting lists. Oh, good. Uh, so we have, just right now, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the, um, I don't have my phone with the, the data, but uh, I think it, it was Berryessa. We already have uh, 30 plus people already waiting. So we could always tap the folks that are on the waiting list to, if, if, if folks don't show up or there's not enough uh, participation in one site, there's a neighboring site that, uh, that maybe has an overflow of folks, and then we tap into that. Oh, wonderful. That's, that's great to hear. And, and you know, just, uh, again, kudos to the work that you're doing. And, and uh, I, I look forward to, to seeing, seeing, seeing the youth out there at the parks during the summer program. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, too. First of all, and some of them are going to be budget related. So, John, you might want to come down. They're a little bit broader question. But um, and you, Maria and Lydia, you may be, Lydia, you may be able to handle them. But just in case you want to phone a friend. Um, but the first question is for, is for the two of you. Is there coordination between the PRNS and library programs? Yes, always. Um, this year especially, we'll be doing a whole a bunch of programs um, with P at PRNS sites, working with them, especially on our summer learning program. We are working with the, all the different sites um, to also host summer learning at their sites. Awesome, yeah. great. Um, Good, that was the answer I was looking for. Um, and then going to, if we could pull up slide four, it's the, um, this slide about how much money was available. Um, it says it's entitled Outreach and Equity Efforts. It, so I just was a little bit unclear from the presentation. Um, the 1.698 million available and then I thought I heard you say, Maria, that um, only 1.2 million of that has been ut utilized so far. So was the 360 that went to agencies, did that come out of the 1.7 or the 1.69? Or 
was it on top of that and we have a bit a bit left so the 1.69 was what was available for this summer the 1 million 200 plus thousand yeah. what was uh utilized during that just that one registration timeline oh, okay so that was that was it. that was in 10 that, days 1.2 of the one point yes. almost seven yes Okay, got it. And then, so is the three hundred sixty on top of that that went that went to the agency? So it's the last bullet. I believe that's something different. Okay, that's not. Okay, so there's still a like four hundred k or whatever that that got utilized after the ten day window. So that when people there was still money available, basically for people to find out about the program. Yes, but I think now it's a lot less than that. Sure. <laughs> Understood. Okay. I just was trying to get it all straight. Um, and then, then uh, for my my next question is basic, basically on the on the um, the cost from eighteen nineteen to twenty twenty two twenty three. So it looks like our costs went from our spending, our expenses went from eight hundred eighty five thousand to about three point two million. Of course, that was including the ARP funding, but the number of people serve the number of kids in the programs was only was not even 300 more so i understand we're covering a hundred percent of the cost but my question is so i understand that why the numbers are not greatly different but we were covering 75 percent of the cost for how many kids last time uh, thank you for the question council member i I'm understanding the last part of your question. I'm not sure I understand the first part. The last part meaning how many kids were served at a 75% level. Yes. Right. That is pre-pandemic. I don't know if, if I don't know if we even have that in our head at this That's point, okay. frankly. Um, during the pandemics when we switched to the 100% model, of course we benefited by having a lot more funding from ARP so we could do that. Um, we have not switched back to that model in the coming year. Um, and that's partly because of what Maria talked about, that what we're realizing is that even at the 75% level, that remaining cost is still a barrier. It's particularly a barrier if you have more than one kid. Okay, and as someone with two children who are now much older, they're aged out of these programs, but yes, I remember that being a big deal. But is, I guess my question is, is the 100% is the model for everybody regardless of need? Oh, no, it's very much needs-based, yeah. So you, you have to demonstrate just any form of public assistance. That could be uh, showing us that you're on Social Security. That could be showing us that you're receiving unemployment benefits or that you have a CalFresh card. I mean, okay. it's very simple, okay. but you just have to be able to show some form of assistance need. Okay, so of the, of the 3,013 kids in the program for 22-23, how many of those were at the 100% level? All of, them. all of those. So how many kids do we serve total? Oh, across all the programs? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have that in front of you. No, I, I, think don't, it's, I don't have that. Uh, in the 10,000 range for the summer. Um, and uh, those are not unduplicated, though. Those okay. are, as Maria talked about, we sort of weekly enrollment. Camps, it's a weekly yeah. enrollment, and it changes. Some people go out of town or they stop using it. So okay. it's not always the same number of kids every week. So is this 3,000 unduplicated? That is yes. unduplicated. So they may have, they have, may have multiple programs to have full summer coverage. Right, and if you did the full summer, that's thousands and thousands of dollars worth of scholarships. That's why we ran through right. 1.2 million so quickly. That's the summer camp program. And if you're going the full eight weeks, it's, it's a huge subsidy, really. Right. Yeah, yeah. In, a, in addition, uh, those, same, those same families are now registering for the programs that maybe they hadn't registered before, the longer ones the full day camps, and so because they're unduplicated, um, it doesn't look like it's a lot, but they're, these are the families that are now registering and are enrolled in our, our all day summer camps, mm -hmm. or in our rock after school programs, or in our preschool classes. And so it's, it's now, those are the folks that get the opportunity to participate when in the past they didn't. And so it, the main numbers may not uh, look like it's a lot, but the units of service that they're getting is huge. So the, yeah, okay, got it, understood. Um, thank you, that's really helpful. And then I guess, John, for you, kind of going forward, is there a way we could structure the program 
rather than just either you're paying 25% or you're paying 100% to a sliding scale so that people who can afford something in between that might be able to pay and then people who maybe can't afford the 25% would be able to, to still utilize the programs at this level. And I, would, I completely understand that the, the less you are able to afford it, the more you probably need the programs. Uh, agreed. Um, it, it is something we've actually considered, um, and you know, it's a trade-off. Um, the, the more the more we move back towards the seventy-five percent, that's fewer people that'll get the hundred, and those, some of those will drop out. They won't. They won't pay. They won't be able to pay. So, you know, f for us, our, obviously, our focus would like to be able to do one hundred percent for anyone who needs it. We're pretty far away from that. Uh, in terms of funding. Uh, we're, we're actually gonna go backwards this coming fiscal year because there'll be less money because the ARP money's going away. Um, sliding scales typically mean you have to do things like income verification, which we try to avoid. Could, um, I, could I maybe just throw something out there? Um, maybe a, a pay what you can model for, for people who qualify and, and then also we got some private funding um, this past year, but those who are paying 100% may be able to help sponsor someone else. We so could, maybe t a couple ideas just to throw out there for, for yeah. folks. Yeah, we, we, we could certainly consider that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, I appreciate the discussion. I just, um, I think these are great programs and I know there is a ton of need and the issue with, with doing 100%, with continuing to do 100%, with less funding, of course, is that we have fewer kids who are going to be able to participate, and I want as many kids to be able to take advantage of the programs as possible. So that's why I think we have, we're going to have to be creative going forward as federal funding isn't going to continue. So um, very much appreciate it. Okay, we're ready for the vote. Would you like to take the vote verbally or electronically? Electronically is faster, I think. Thanks. Okay. All right, that motion carries. Okay, so should we go back to D1? Yes, Andreas nodding. We're gonna go back to D1, San Jose Youth Empowerment Alliance. Andrea, do you wanna introduce the team? Uh, Petra Reguero, our program manager uh, for BEST, Mario Maciel, our division manager for the San Jose Youth Empowerment Alliance, Israel Canjura, our recreation superintendent, and Maribel Al. Kazar, um, our senior analysts are here with you today. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't have everybody's name on here, so that's why I <laughs> made you do it. <laughs> well, I think we're ready to get started, right? All right. Good afternoon, members of the NSC committee. Uh, again, I'm Mario Maciel, division manager of our Youth Empowerment Alliance, formerly the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. Uh, today, we're here to give you our annual update on both our best and youth intervention services. Um, both which are pillars of that amazing collective impact that holds up what we now call again our San Jose Youth Empowerment Alliance. We know that today we're here to focus on best and youth intervention services, but the successes we've had, council members, has obviously been a partnership with our schools, our churches, all the county resources that exist, and our communities fighting for a better quality of life. That being said, um, it is a pleasure to be with you today, building off over 30 years of partnership, spanning over five mayors and countless council administrations. And uh, we look forward to another set of, of council that we get to embark on this partnership with. It's been an amazing journey of over 30 years. Uh, today's presentation will highlight the great partnership to keep our youth and San Jose community safe between city programs and our amazing community-based organizations. That being said, next slide. This next slide will show you the programs and best uh, and grant programs that make up the quantifiables we'll be showcasing today. The legend will show you that the purple or shape, sorry, what shape is that? That, that purple thing is the youth intervention <laughs> services and our yellow uh, thingies are our grant making programs, gee many Christ. Anyways, for those of you that are new to our council and I know Councilmember Davis has been with us for a while, but there's so many new faces. The seven programs that make up our youth intervention unit are our female intervention team, pretty self-explanatory. 
females have their own needs, need to be honored and, and serviced in an appropriate fashion. So with the support of council, we have that. Our Safe School Campus Initiative aims at preventing and de-escalating violence. On that sacred place, we called schools, middle schools and high schools. Uh, 19 school districts makes it a challenge, but we found a way to service. A clean slate tattoo removal obviously speaks for itself. You can't get to your future if people are judging the book by the cover. So taking those tattoos off your neck, wrist, and face is obvious. Um, Hospital-based intervention for those poor souls that do end up stabbed or shot and end up in our ER rooms, it's not just the time to sit there and heal and, and fester on retaliation, but it's an awesome opportunity to come bedside and take advantage of that epiphany that if you got shot or stabbed, it might be time to change your life. And so that hospital-based program is amazing. Uh, digital arts, it's our ability to, to, to give an opportunity to this marginalized community that has a story to tell, whether through photos, video, or music production. Um, we call that our icing on the cake, but we love having it at Roosevelt Park and also at our Sunil Continuation School. Um, the last two are our San Jose Works, our jobs initiative. Thanks to you all, we also uh, place over 150 youth every summer in viable, you know, career resume building type of uh, opportunities. And lastly, our late night gyms. The population we serve will is hesitant to come to our average everyday hours within our community centers. They don't feel accepted. They they they're marginalized. That being said, we've found a way to open up these doors through Late Night Gym, offering them carrying adults, warm food, and basketball, handball, soccer. And people go, so we're just recreating. Well, no, that's, that's the hook. And we build relationships, and from there we move on to taking your tattoo off, getting you a job, getting you back in school, et cetera. That being said, let me pass it over to Petra Reguero to tell you about our funding arm. Thanks, Mario. Uh, good afternoon, Chair uh, and Committee, uh, Petra Aguero, Program Manager. Um, I have the pleasure of working along with my team uh, with our nonprofit partners who provide all of the services through these grant programs. We have some here today. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about, give you some background on the Bringing Everyone's Strengths Together grant program, which is our largest grant program, and our Safe Summer Initiative grant program. Um, and so both programs uh, use a place-based strategy. So with that, we prioritize our services within hot spots in San Jose. So those are neighborhoods in San Jose that experience more youth crime. And so we prioritize in those areas. Um, both programs also serve the Alliance population, which is those youth and families in BEST that uh, experience high-risk behavior. So we prioritize in certain areas of San Jose and those youth and families that have the highest need. Um, for both programs. So for BEST, again, is our largest grant program. We fund on an annual basis um, for 21-22, we funded a little under 2.5 million. Uh, we funded 15 agencies. And uh, through BEST, we qualify agencies through a request for qualification process. And that is on a triannual basis. So every three years we qualify and then we fund annually um, for those types of services like uh, school-based services, youth groups out at our high schools, middle schools, some elementary schools. Um, we have youth support groups, cognitive behavioral intervention. Uh, we have street outreach intervention services where we have agencies going out to all 18 hotspots, uh, meeting youth where, where they're at, doing pro-social recreational activities to make that connection and engage uh, youth, and then hopefully bringing them into case management so they can have a positive person in their life and hopefully get them on the right path. Uh, we do uh, vocational training, so getting them ready for jobs, and uh, working with parents, building their parents' parenting skills, and then the last one is providing case management services. So that's that one-on-one, -on -one going out to their home, working with the family um, to, to make sure they're meeting their goals as a family. Um, so SSIG is around 500000 a year. Um, again, this is an application that is annually, every summer. They provide services uh, June through August. Um, it's a smaller grant. We fund in, in the last uh, 2022 is about 36 agencies. Um, and in those in that program, it's mainly recreational and enrichment. We do some academic programs that help uh, elementary kids connect to their middle school or middle school kids connect to their high school. So that transition is a little easier. Um, and so that's a little bit background on those two grant programs. 
And now I want to jump into the participants served by youth intervention and the grant programs. So in 21-22, we served 7,609 participants. Um, and uh, with that, we had BEST was about 3,000, a little over 3,000. We had SSIG that served 2,800 in 2022. And then youth intervention served about 1,700. And so what you're seeing here on this slide, you can see in 2021, uh, agencies and staff programs were still uh, limited with COVID restrictions and still doing hybrid virtual classes, were not able to go on school campuses. And so in 21, 22, you're seeing that, you know, people were back in person, agencies and youth intervention were back at schools, were back doing uh, case management, you know, in-person services. And so you're seeing that uh, participant uh, increase in 21, 22. So I'll turn it over to Israel now, who's going to talk a little bit about some demographic information on the participants that were served. I'm having a hard time to see. Go. Thank you, Petra. This, um, so council members, this, um, the issue of gang involvement and youth participating in that has always, uh, and there's been a belief that it's only a male issue, uh, and it's not. You know, and we know that you know we we stand here in providing those resources to a wider range of both female and male because of the fact that we've had leaders in the council as well as advocates that have uh, consistently told us that is not just a male center issue, and so therefore, you know, uh, with best, what you see here is that the individuals served through best females is about was about 51 percent of the of um of the group served are female while males made up about 48 percent of those participants served and that's a uh, that's because of the fact that best services are usually focused in the middle schools as well as some of the high schools so school-based programming tend to be more uh geared towards uh female participants um, in addition to that, though, on the, um, on the youth intervention side, we are focused on the most um, gang intentional, gang involved youth, where you see that the um, change is, is significant in terms of the youth that we serve, which are 75% um, versus 25% uh, of um, female participants. Um, Next slide, please. Can, can I just say, yes. I'm sorry, this is Andrea. What you're, the slide you're seeing is not the most updated slide deck. So what's in your packet should, or what's on Legistar should be the most updated. We apologize for that last slide. And so the information on this slide really highlights um, the fact that best services, about 80% of those services are for at-risk and high-risk youth while about 20% is for the gang impacted, gang intentional. And I'm glad that, you know, these this resources are available at the gang intentional, gang involved level because of the fact that, you know, we, we can't do this work alone, right? So we have agencies like uh, Pro, uh, this um, New Hope for Youth as well as uh, Catholic Charities that are providing resources and services to our most at-risk youth in the, uh, the most um, marginalized communities, which we have about 18 hotspots now. They're trying to like, you know, we're trying to change that name to like uh, Opportunity Neighborhoods. But um, we're glad that they're uh, helping us do that work. And um, again, in youth intervention, we actually have about 100% of our youth are, part are in the gang impacted, gang intentional space. And as, um, and we continue to like work really hard to ensure that um, all those resources and services are provided to the um, to the youth through our programs that we that we have. And now I'm going to turn it over to Maribel. Good afternoon. My name is Maribel. I'm the senior grants analyst. I oversee Best SSIG amongst other two other grant programs. As you know, the Best program is a very robust program, and naturally, we are interested in learning about the results and services provided by our grant partners. Petra and Israel touched upon uh, the implementation study that this slide reflects the outcomes of that. Um, on an annual ba basis, the best partners administer a survey provided by uh, Social Policy Research, SPR, and there's abundance of information 
on the full report with the link is provided on the memo for you. But here we pulled two major important assets that we feel that the committee would be most interested in. One being the youth reporting feeling more confident to handle what comes their way and being able to handle problems and challenges in a positive manner uh, when they arise. And two, that 87% of the youth report feeling more, um, feeling always or often feeling there was an adult who cared for them and 90% stating that they always or often felt heard by adults. Confidence and perception of a caring adult who listened to them are great outcomes of the best grant program. However, we do not want to sugarcoat everything. Uh, there were challenges post pandemic due to the hybrid models, um, limited one on one services, and we did see a decline in connectedness due to, post uh, due to these post pandemic factors. However, looking forward, next slide, please. There are some upcoming key projects that uh, the San Jose Youth Empowerment Alliance has, one being the strategic plan which is adopted for 2023 to 2026. We also have, um, in keeping pace with BEST, Youth Intervention Services is now in the second phase of their evaluation, um, which will be able to provide fee uh, feedback um, of, of the performance. And then in addition to that, the BEST Partner Engagement Group, which is a group um, established of BEST partners who provide feedback for enhancement of the program. In addition to that, we have the RFQ for the BEST, which we are currently underway. Uh, we are in the evaluation process where we'll be able to determine the awardees and notify the awarded partners for, tw for the 2023 to 2026 triannual period where we'll be able to have a new qualified el eligible providers to be able to serve our youth and they will be notified next month in June. And lastly, we have our RFP for the data management system currently underway, which will be able to help San Jose Youth Empowerment Alliance tell a story of what we're doing through data that we, are wish, to, that we wish to collect throughout our best partners, uh, youth intervention services, amongst others. And so thank you for your time and we are opening it up to questions. Thank you. We'll go to the public first. We have one public speaker card, Dan Coleman. Please make your way down to the podium. You will have two minutes to speak. He's making his way down. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Dan Coleman. I'm the Program Director for Youth Empowerment for Success with Catholic Charities. I think there might actually be a few others that want to do some public comment. Um, but just here to show our support for the Youth Empowerment Alliance. Uh, it's a pleasure to get to work with PNRS. I think um, the, the work that we're able to do through these programs uh, really helps us at Catholic Charities to fulfill our mission of serving some of the most underserved in the community and help them to develop uh, strong relationships with us and with their families and, and connect them to the community to help them to uh, get some, some positive outlooks on life and, and important uh, changes that can help them to be successful. So just wanna uh, say our support for this and uh, thank you. Thank you, we will now go to the Zoom speakers. If, hold on a second. Okay. Um, if there are other members of the public who would like to speak on this item, there are yellow speaker cards uh, right by these clear boxes on each side down in the front. You can fill out a speaker card and turn it in and we'll call you. There should be some, they might need some writing utensils. Go ahead, we can go to Zoom in the meantime. Paul? Uh, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Que vole Mario? Um, I, I, and I mean this sincerely. Thank you for the uh, types of questions that you were asking, uh, Councilwoman Davis. I appreciate that. They were very consistent and aligned with the with an understanding and comprehension of what you were looking at. And I appreciate that. Um, 
we need to really move away from the language. The language that's being used in these meetings is disrespectful. And I don't think it's intentional, not from anybody here, but it is intentional from the people that write it. And I don't know if maybe AI technology is possibly writing these documents. I, I suspect that there may be AI technology that's writing these documents, but that's another issue. So anyways, what these kids are from barrios that when you put the redlining map on top of it, they are victims of racialized, institutionalized and systemic racism. Until we get to that language within the context of these conversations, you were never going to get to the root of the problem. These are not gang impacted. These kids are not gang members. They're looking for familia. Why? Because their familia is working. These people aren't poor. These people are the ones that are working in the drag queen. These are the sons and daughters of the people that supported this city throughout the pandemic in the construction, in the buildings that are still in the community, in the hotels, in the food service, <laughs> delivering the food, preparing the food stocking the shelves these are the sons and daughters of those people so we're not people that need a handout what we need is some respect respect from the city and respect and we want it through budget allocations to ensure that the kids that were most impacted by systemic racism are 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 given their due justice and we do it economically thank you and then we have one public speaker card for Philip Rodriguez. You can make your way down to the podium. And the timer is also on the podium. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Philip Rodriguez. I'm the founder of New Hope for Youth. And I just want to uh, you know, say that it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to serve the community through this avenue that you guys give us, right? And so and when I was a child, right? There was none of this in the 70s, the 80s and stuff. There was nobody coming to my home and doing home visits. There was nobody coming to my complexes and trying to take me out to pro socials or, you know, trying to get me a job or to get me into education. You know what I mean? And so this right here, what we do, it really does work. You know what I mean? If you're looking at over, what, almost 2 million people in this city, you know what I'm saying? And where the gang activity is, where the you know, the, the crime is right now. In other cities, it's very high. You know what I mean, but in this city, because of this efforts and this collaboration between CBOs, you know, city, city entities, county entities and stuff, and the work that's being put out there, it really does work, right? And so we're able to go into these high poverty neighborhoods. We're able to go in there and make relationships with this, these kids, their families, see what their needs are. And through you guys, we're able to provide that service to them, right? To help them with food, help them get education, help them to see that there's more to just that one block or those couple of blocks that they're, they're chilling in, right? There is actually activities they can do that broaden their minds, their, their horizon, there's more to life, right? And so I just want to say, you know what, thank you, you know what I mean? And for the change of the, you know, the name to what it is now, and I know that we're working on changing more of those names, like Paul Soto said, the gang stuff and all that, right? That does need to be changed. Those are things that we need to address because we can't label, you know, our young people or even our adults because that's not who they are. You know, they're, they're human beings. They're somebody's daughters and sons, right? And so, thank you. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Come from Bertis. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I really want to thank uh, staff for uh, the very important presentation. I really appreciate the work that you do being the council member uh, uh, of District 5 uh, and just the history of, you know, the lack of intergenerational um, wealth that's been built in District 5 and how our youth have been siphoned into gangs. Um, your services mean a lot, and obviously I myself as a young adult went through your programs as well at Clean Slate. Um, and, and other services participated with organizations that were funded by the city for gang intervention. So um, your work definitely does a lot. Uh, it, it, it moves mountains for these youth um, and, and provides uh, alternatives uh, for, for many individuals who um, have good intentions. However, the options that they're being provided um, at the time are, are limited. Um, I, I did have a few questions. Um, I saw on one of the metrics that you had 
there was two, uh, I guess, uh, um, categories. One was gang impacted and one was gang intentional. Can you define what the differences are between those two? I'll give it, a, I'll give it the first shot. Council member, you, there are written definitions for each as we release our RFP. I could read it verbatim, but just to synopsis yeah. it. When we start getting into gang impacted, it's an individual who's now probably got a probation officer, has started to see uh, the law enforcement type of angle mm -hmm. really placed upon them. It's no longer just a fad. It's no longer just clicking up and hanging out with buddies, but we're committing smaller offenses. Gang intentional, sir, is the last category, and that's that youth who's saying, I am Norte, por vida. Yeah. You know, yeah. Those kind of kids that are just blatant about it and seem to find identity in it. Mm -hmm. And so without a doubt, that's the last category. Um, and the ones that we really need help from the Phils and the Catholic yeah. Charities because uh, their staff uh, resemble the population and they're mm -hmm. able to hire staff that sometimes we within city just can't vet into our systems. And yeah. so that partnership is amazing. So. Due to like hiring blockers and things like that, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, and so about the youth who are, you know, quote unquote, gang intentional, the youth that may want to resist programming, right? Because I remember when I was young, I ain't programming with the city, woo -woo, you know, people see that as like a weak thing to do. Like, what, how do we reach those youth? What's, what, what is the strategy for those, you know, because I'm happy to see the youth who are participating in the program, but I'm also worried about the youth who aren't. Well, council member, I'll let Petra jump in here, but I'll tell you that all our staff within Youth Intervent are expecting 1,010 no's. It's <laughs> yeah. a 1,011th one that we're hoping to just finally break you down. Whether I'm a gnat in your ear or just that, that angel on your shoulder that's saying when you're ready, because too many municipalities and organizations are built on a grant or mm -hmm. a, a measure, and you expect everyone to change because you built it. And what we've done here in the city of San Jose has had the longevity to know that you've got to be there when they're ready, sir. And so uh, I'll leave it at that, but pass it over to Petra. Yeah, just for, for the grant program for BEST, we've worked with the nonprofit partners to form a strategy on how they um, reach out to these youth that are in the different areas, the neighborhoods in San Jose. And so they just go out and start, I'm sure Philip or uh, Dan can probably explain this. They're the experts, but I'll do my best. Uh, they go out into the communities and they make what's called cold street contact. They just go out, they see where these, uh, the kids are hanging out and they just introduce themselves. It starts mm. just with that introduction and get, uh, getting them engaged into different activities. They'll do a pro social, a barbecue. You start building that relationship and start building that respect and trust and then hopefully getting them into case management eventually which then is a whole nother program where you're meeting one-on-one, -on -one, you're meeting their families, you're understanding what the family needs, um, you're hopefully getting them a job, um, getting them resources. And so that's, that's typically what the strategy, I, of, of course, everybody's different and so may require you know, different types of services. I, I appreciate that. That's the, um, I think the hands-on uh, approach that we, we need to you know, have with our youth. If they're posted up and poke away or on Oak and Almaden, we need to have our staff going out there saying, hey, what's up, what's going on? These are programs, this is alternatives to what, um, what's going on. So essentially that's, that's what we're doing as of now with, with those services, great. I'm, I'm glad to, to, to hear that because we can't wait around for people to walk into the doors of the city and expect people to just be like, oh, I wanna you know, look at all other alternatives. Um, could you elaborate uh, more in regards to the Safe School Campus program and how those services are provided? Absolutely, uh, council member. That in itself could be a, a two hour presentation. Let me try to give it to you in a snapshot here. It's a collaboration between SJPD, probation, ourselves, and school districts to, to have a protocol that aims at preventing and de-escalating violence. What we know is that incidents that start Friday night, Saturday night out in our communities are gonna spill onto your campus at 8 a.m. Monday morning. Un unannounced to administrations, they're, they're unprepared. So this communication protocol allows us to communicate to schools and put them on alert when needed, and vice versa, council member. As you know, beef starting on campus is gonna spill out yeah. into our communities on the weekend before this initiative was in place. Both silos knew things were gonna happen, but the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Mm -hmm. So again, this partnership really means 
we're having safety meetings with every school district where we know every single principal and vice principal of discipline on all 19 school districts. There are approximately 100 middle schools and high schools in this city. It's quite a, an, a, yeah. an achievement, but it's also our largest funded program, Mayor. I mean, <laughs> Mayor, I'm predicting the future, Council there we Member. Go. Um, <laughs> of our allocation, it is nearly about 1.5 million get put into Safe School Campus Initiative. It's, it's a team of about 20 interventionists, sir, mm -hmm. that uh, have lived the lifestyle and can come onto campus at lunchtime and diffuse things, be there after school. And then these same interventionists then switch into a case management approach. As you know, school ends at 3, 3.30, but staff work till mm -hmm. 7, 10 p.m. at night, depending on program. Yeah. So that latter half of your day is when you really get to take on eight to 10 youth that become your caseload out of these communities. And it's been an am amazing process to see how that high touch really is what's been most effective for council members. I, I appreciate that, because I know that a lot of our youth, un unfortunately, are, you know, uh, I. I speak about gangs because I was formerly in a gang and I know the realities of Eastside San Jose and I don't mean that to offend anyone, but a lot of them are introduced at school. You know, you make friends there, you, you go hang out with them, they introduce you to other individuals. So it's really important, even in our middle schools. I mean, I, I joined a gang when I was 12 years old. So we have people out there who, you know, they, they don't realize they're preying on our youth. They feel like they're helping them out, but it's a way of life that really has ramifications. Um, do we have any sort of metric of evaluation uh, for the organizations that receive best fun, uh, best funds. Are we looking at like, you know, are, are the youth that participating participating in it getting better grades, or are they graduating high school, or are they able to get jobs? What sort of metric are we using for the nonprofits that we're collaborating with? So currently, our performance uh, measurement framework is looking at mainly social emotional um, outcomes and participant satisfaction. Those are the key. Um, items that we're currently evaluating, and like Maribel mentioned in the presentation, we use a survey for that, um, parent and participant. Moving forward, though, we do want to look at academic and any, you know, truancy. We look at any arrest probation, which is what we're going to look for in this next year. Um, we're working with another consultant that is helping us to frame that and looking at data sharing agreements, um, being able to share individual level data from school data to probation data. Uh, and so that's something that is on our horizon that we definitely want to get to. Okay, great, great. Because I know uh, I've worked in public policy previously and, and like I know I want to make sure that these grants aren't being provided on a compliance basis just because they check boxes and things like that. I really want to make sure we're making inroads in these populations. They haven't had the services that they've needed. They, they haven't had the opportunities. So I want to make sure that the money that's going to this is actually going to um, results. But that being said, I, I, as I mentioned, I appreciate your work. You know, I, I, as a graduate of the Clean Slate program, I'm walking proof that your work, your programs work. So thank you for your services. This is Andrea, if I could just add in, I just wanna remind those members of the committee that are also on the Youth Empowerment Alliance policy team that we have an OKR specifically about bringing back data, uh, both program outcomes and sort of community indicators that would be disaggregated with an equity lens. So that's one of our OKRs for this year. Thank you. Councilmember Torres. Good afternoon. Uh, just like Councilmember Ortiz, I'm too a product of the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. So you have uh, two former participants who are now council members. And so that um, that's, you know, speaks to volumes of the incredible work that our um, Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force, or now YEA, um, is doing so, and I, I, I do see, I do see So up there, who was uh, one of my leaders at Washington United Youth Center. So uh, I'm so glad that he's still uh, serving our, our Washington youth. It's a very, very needed uh, program in, in our Washington neighborhood. Uh, I have, uh, I have a, a couple of, uh, couple of questions. Uh, I've been approached by, by um, a couple of nonprofits to, to, to um, work with our, our, our at-risk youth, uh, and um, I know that I see here late night gym. Um, the late night gym that's run by that's run by some of our nonprofits, not necessarily our city, right? That is a partnership, Council Member Torres. Uh, we do have a de city dedicated specialist coordinating the efforts, you know, purchasing equipment, being out there. But at each one of those late night gyms, if that gym is in the hot spot that New Hope for Youth is in, they'll be the street outreach team that recruits and is there physically to make sure we have a ratio 
of acceptable. You know, it's a tough population. You want to have the right ratio of staff when you open, right. and not just one city staffer. But again, that partnership between us and Best, and being able to bring our resources into one facility makes an effort like that possible. Great, yeah, and I, I ask because uh, I've had a, a couple of uh, service providers who actually want to take it out of the, you know, the environment of being indoors, right? I know that uh, one of the service pro providers wants to do like a, a late night uh, basketball session uh, at Pacastel Park, which as you know, uh, Northside no longer being an opportunity neighborhood, um, but uh, there's still some, uh, you know, with some, some concerns, you know, of ongoing concerns of uh, what's happening in, in, in Northside, and they want to do a potential, like, uh, summer summertime, late night gym session at, uh, at Pocastle Park outside, right? Uh, so I was thinking of, of, you know, connecting you all with, with the service provider, so. Well, council members, that'd be a perfect referral for our Safe Summer Initiative. Yeah. Grant. That is the type yeah. of partnership we're seeking, you know? Um, it's not to pay the foundation of any agency, it's to allow them to yeah. do things that with their own budgets, they just never can get there, you know? Right. The yeah. fun stuff, so right. we'd love to meet this agency wanting to do that at Absolutely. Picasso and engage. Yeah, I would encourage them to apply for the Safe Summer Initiative grant, also being a part of the Alliance, so joining the Alliance and attending mm -hmm. the monthly tech team where they can partner with the number of different agencies. Great, yeah. oh, um, so there, the applications are still open for the Safe Summer Initiative? Not for the 2023, but uh, for, I can definitely put out the information that has been okay. uh, released previously to prepare them for the next application. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I was thinking of probably doing a budget document for my for my office for this uh, organization. So I'll, I'll keep you all uh, definitely keep you all in the loop uh, about that. Um, so uh, I, I, I it's not necessarily not necessarily a a, a question, but more. Uh, but more uh, comments on on why our youth master plan. I know uh, we I've been talking about it, and poor John, he keep I keep catching him in the elevator, and I keep uh, uh, telling him why uh, a youth master plan or a director of youth services is extremely important. Uh, as you just heard, Chairman Davis uh, just Chairwoman Davis. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Chairwoman Davis uh, just just mentioned if PRNS and library are coordinating or speaking when we're serving our youth. Uh, and I know that they are, because we have incredible folks in, in both departments. Uh, but but this, is, this is the reason why we, we want to make sure that we have youth, uh, that we're investing in our youth in one silo, right? In one department, one, one organization. Uh, because one, we don't want our youth to continue to fall through the cracks, right? Because we know that uh, investing in our youth, right, deters Crime, investing in our youth, uh, you know, it eliminates poverty, right? Investing in our youth, you keep going, right? All the positives when we invest in our youth, right? Our youth are the bedrock of, of any city, right? Because they're the future, right? So, um, so you know, I'm 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 committed. Uh, I hear uh, that you know, 2.5 million dollars uh, is 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 what we have uh, for our best and for our safe summer. Uh, I, as a council member, I think that we it should be more. Right, because I, as you just uh, heard this morning, right, with um, with some council members concerned about redirecting measury monies and redirecting affordable housing money, well, that's why we're in the situation we're in, right? We're we have we we have crime in our neighborhoods because we never invested fully invested in youth, right? We have we have a large unhoused population because we we never fully invested in, in youth and families, and so. By investing in our youth, hopefully we can eradicate those issues uh, and create a beautiful city with beautiful neighborhoods. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Candelas. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, yeah, my comments are just going to be brief. I, uh, you know, I just wanted to say thank you to Mario and your team for um, the work um, uh, for San Jose Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, especially the programming from the clean slate to the late night gyms. Um, uh, you know, um, I, I think the, our youth truly benefit from that. I was a, a, a participant in the late night gym program, so that, that's three participants on the dais of this program uh, back in the day. So um, anyways, just keep up the good work, and, and we look forward to, uh, to interacting and strengthening our, our, our youth empowerment uh, movement. Thank you. Do you want to make a motion? 
I will move the report, or move acceptance of the Second. report. Second. <laughs> Council Member Devon. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I appreciate uh, the staff on the incredible work and Mario, Petra, Israel, and Amerigal. It just it's amazed me the amount of work that you guys put together to take care of our youth and young adults. Um, and again, thank you to the city staff and all the volunteers as well. I do have a couple of questions. <clears throat> the Safe School Campus Initiative, and you talk about uh, police involvement and so on, and I would imagine police involvement would be the, the last step. I would imagine that you would have the schools and the counselor, the principal, all that, to coordinate with, with, with the news that is in having a problem, if, if you will. Council Member, you're right on point. PD is the last thing we want to resort to. We respond to safe, in Safe School Campus to approximately 450 to 500 activations annually. Although this year, sir, we're on pace for 600. Coming back from the pandemic, there was a lot of checks written online and now kids are seeing each other and the beef is real now, right? And so we're responding a lot this year. But typically, sir, we respond in three levels of activation. A level three is what we want. We want an administrator to call us when it's still a rumor. We hear that Petra and Maribel want to fight at 3 p.m., but it's only noon. Sir, if you know our school administrators, God bless them, they're pseudo parents, pseudo, you know, a teacher. Uh, well, they're everything, the, hat, the amount of hats they wear. And what ends up happening is they can't follow up on a rumor with the volume of work they do. So at three o'clock, Maribel and Petra really do fight. They lose their education, they get violated on probation. When this protocol allows us, again, through communication, to get alerted on what we call a level three. Level threes are what we want the most of. A level two is, it's eminent. We actually know what time they're gonna fight. At three o'clock at the bus stop, can you please send staff there to kind of prevent it? Our mere presence can stop the fight. A level one though, sir, is when stuff hits the fan, when it's out of our control. We've had a mob fight, we've had an intruder with a gun on campus. That is the only time we want SJPD there. Uh, we are not equipped to go and deal with that. So uh, as much as we know law enforcement has its role and its lane, there are times where even us in the intervention world know that law enforcement is what's needed at this moment in time, but only in those circumstances. Sir. Thank you. The last question is, <clears throat> Do you have the stat for how many youth or young adults that use the tattoo uh, removal program? Well, I can tell you how many annually do, sir. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, annually, we're, res we're servicing approximately 100 youth annually. Wow. But we wish it could be more, but the demands on the hospital and the fact that it varies depending on, and I think you can ask Council Member Ortiz about this, uh, <laughs> depending on how dark the tattoo is, what colors you have. An individual could, you could come in and your tattoo could be removed in two sessions. Another individual could take up to two years, council member. And so we have to be cognizant of our backlogging of youth so that they get serviced by the laser in a, in a timely manner. So about 100 a year, but currently we have about 300 youth getting treatments because it takes so long to finish that, sir. But it's about 100 that come through and finish their 30 hours of community service, there's six weeks of life skills courses, and now it's really dependent on how deep that tattoo was for, the, for them to finish the process. Well, I'm, I'm lucky enough if I only got one tattoo. That was uh, when I was 10 years old and a pencil stabbed me in the hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, it's, it's incredible work that you're doing and, and very supportive of, of what you guys are doing. It's just absolutely hands down, you guys are incredible, thank you. Thank you, we're ready for the vote. And that motion passes, and uh, we're gonna take another item out of order. We're gonna go next to the Youth Commission annual report. I think we have some youth commissioners here. All right. Jill, would you like to introduce this item while they're coming down to the box? Yes, thank you so much, Chairperson. Um, the library is very excited to be the staff um, team that supports our youth commission 
and we uh, started working with the Youth Commission a couple of years ago in uh, a transfer from our partners at PRNS. And so we're very excited to have our commission, the majority of our commissioners were able to be here to represent themselves. They've been doing a tremendous amount of work on uh, learning about how the city works, how you all work, how you influence uh, the city through policy, and um, how they can even be more effective in um, informing and supporting the work that you do as council. So I'm gonna introduce Megan Malloy, who is our librarian at Teen HQ at the Martin Luther King Junior Library. And she is the main staffer who supports the Youth Commission. Thank you all so much. Um, as Jill just said, I'm Megan Malloy. I'm a librarian at Teen HQ. And I've been the coordinator for the Youth Commission for the past year. Um, and this is a group of dedicated young people. Uh, they're appointed to advise you all on the matters of youth in our city. Today, they're gonna be showcasing their hard work and dedication to making San Jose a better place for all youth. Um, this is an opportunity to hear from the Youth Commission presenting to you for the first time. And for some of our commissioners, this will be their last time before their term ends. Uh, we thank you for your attention and support and acknowledging their vital contributions to their community. Welcome. All right, thank you, Ms. Moy. And just for the record, Ms. Moy is the best. Just wanted to get on the record, but yeah. All right, so good afternoon, council members and staff. My name is Gordon Chen. I represent District 1 and have had the pleasure of serving as chair for the past year on the San Jose Youth Commission. I'm here today with my fellow commissioners to provide an update on the Youth Commission's activities this year. Developed over 50 years ago, the Youth Commission is the official advisory group to mayor and the city council, which empowers and encourages youth to be civically engaged through local and citywide events and initiatives. The Youth Commission represents approximately 248,000 youth under the age of 19 in San Jose, promoting available resources and opportunities, providing equitable access and support to marginalized youth communities, and developing policy recommendations concerning youth. The library department, namely the Teen HQ unit, assumed leadership and management of the San Jose Youth Commission in 2021, aligning with the city's education and digital literacy strategy. The Youth Commission leads on the values of responsibility, teamwork, empathy, inclusivity, empowerment, and integrity. The Youth Commission is comprised of 11 commissioners, one from each city council district and one citywide, and they work alongside other volunteer youth in their district youth advisory councils, or YACs, to develop policy proposals, host events, and create initiatives to better relay youth priorities and movements to local public officials. The City of San Jose Youth Commission outlined a work plan for the fiscal year 2022 to 23 to empower San Jose youth and provide them with a safe, inclusive, and accessible space to express their passions and interests. The work plan consists of five objectives, each with specific actions. My name is Andrew Liu, and I represent District 5 on the San Jose Youth Commission. The first objective is to empower youth to pursue their careers and encourage them to be civically engaged through local and citywide events and initiatives. To achieve this, the commission hosted many events, including a civic summit, and district youth leadership conferences alongside regularly meeting youth advisory councils to provide a platform for constructive discussion, collaboration among youth, and encourage them to be civically active and engaged citizens. My name is Nuha Khan. I represent District 4 on the San Jose Youth Commission. The second objective is to foster safe, inclusive, and accessible space for the youth of San Jose to express their passions and interests. The commission collaborated with the city manager's office and their YACs to host one virtual and one in-person town hall in order to integrate youth ideas and awareness to the development of the children and youth master plan, as well as coordinate with Beautify SJ initiative to host volunteer opportunities for the youth to clean up their districts. My name is Dietra Huang. I represent district three of the San Jose Youth Commission. The third objective is to provide equitable access and support to marginalized youth communities. The commission advocates for underrepresented youth community communities through outreach and commission developed volunteer events that center around the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The youth commission partnered with the library's Teen HQ 
in coordinating the annual youth survey to recognize the awareness of city resources created to ensure that marginalized youth can fully participate in and benefit from high quality out of school time programs. My name is Aldo Joel Gonzalez Muniz. I represent District 8 on the San Jose Youth Commission. The fourth objective is to promote awareness about various issues and opportunities for San Jose youth. The Youth Commission received approval to create and maintain an Instagram account to outreach to San Jose youth and promote resources, opportunities, and events happening in the city, in addition to updating the Youth Herald, our outreach newsletter that is hosted on the library's website. My name is Vedant Janapati. I am the citywide representative on the San Jose Youth Commission. The fifth and final objective is to advise and prompt city council to act upon youth priorities and input. The commission conveyed youth priorities of safety, the environment, and social equity through policy recommendations and memorandums. Finally, they submitted a letter of budget priorities and recommendations to the city council based on the city budgetary forecast and youth input from the annual budget summit. My name is Ananya Sriram. I represent District 7 and have had the pleasure of serving as the commission's vice chair for the past year. In October of 2022, City Council directed the Youth Commission and staff to explore expanding the age of the Youth Commission appointment eligibility and expanding youth representation on city boards and commissions. The Commission developed recommendations to increase diverse and underrepresented youth civic participation and provide a seat at the table for young people to contribute to decisions made on their behalf. Article 5 of the San Jose Bill of Rights for Children and Youth states that children and youth have a voice in their local government to advocate for the issues that matter to them. This article recognizes the importance of engaging youth people in local government and the inclusion of youth in decision making is critical for creating a more equitable and sustainable future. Young people have unique perspectives skills and experiences that can contribute to creating more innovative and effective solutions to address social, economic, and environmental challenges. The recommendations strengthen the role of the Youth Commission to serve as a bridge between young people and the government officials, helping to ensure that the voices of young people are heard and considered in policy decisions. The library will report on these recommendations at the next month's NSE meeting. The next steps include our final meeting of this fiscal year and our annual recognition awards in June. The commission looks forward to working with newly appointed commissioners from districts one, two, four, and 10 at the work plan retreat at the start of the work year in August. Thank you for your time. We, gre we greatly appreciate this opportunity to share a little about our work with the broader audience. And I am confident that future commissioners will build off of our progress this year to continue improving the quality of life and expanding opportunity for the youth of San Jose building a safer and more equitable space for youth to express themselves in. And today does mark essentially the end of both my youth commission and high school career. It's a little emotional, but again, I am like absolutely confident um, that th these, this wonderful group of commissioners will carry on the amazing work they've done so far this year. And I am really excited to see where this all goes. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentation and thank you for all the work that you have done to connect the youth to the council and, and for your participation in our community. I really appreciate it. Um, we'll go now to public comment. Paul. Paul, go ahead. Paul Soto. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I've attended many of these youth commissions. Like, again, you guys, I know you guys don't believe this, but I literally go to every single meeting. And one of the things that I noticed is that there is kind of a lack, there's a lack of understanding and comprehension of exactly what equity is 
because inequity has never been centered within the context of these this particular meeting. So having what would be helpful and what I try to institute the people that are in this meeting is that we have to examine from 1846 until today and see the progression. See, I don't expect somebody that's Vietnamese to understand. I don't expect somebody that is uh, Indian from, from Asia to understand what it's like to be Chicano or Mexicano in California. I don't expect that. But when it comes time. Back to the committee. Thank you. Council Member Torres. Hi, uh, good evening. Good evening. That, that, those comments threw me off. So good afternoon. Uh, and uh, you know, thank you for all the work that uh, that you that you did. Um, but uh, I was part of uh, the District Three YAC also when I was uh, a youth. So um, just all involved here. I know. <laughs> uh, so um, you know, uh, I want to congratulate Commissioner Chen on graduating high school and going on to college. So congratulations. It's extremely important. Uh, so I know that uh, you, you all are getting on social media because it's super important for our youth. Uh, so you're on IG, but is there other other social media platforms that you're all on? We do have a Facebook that I was just able to recover finally. Oh, good. Um, and so we are working on building um, a, a little bit more, strengthening our outreach, and that will be built a little bit closer into our work plan next year is the plan. And we will be utilizing uh, Facebook and Instagram, and then we do have the Youth Herald blog, which lives on the library website, um, where we'll be updating it with events and um, information about uh, things that the Youth Commission are doing in the community. Great, and um, I know a lot of our youth are on TikTok now, so are you planning on getting on TikTok? If the communications department, if they would love to have us, if, if the Youth Commission could pioneer the first official TikTok, I think we would we would take on that challenge. I know it's something that um, the commissioner, unfortunately, it's AP exam week, so that's why all of our commissioners aren't here today. Oh, yeah, but the important. commissioner who's been running our Instagram um, from District 6, uh, I know she would really love for us to be on TikTok. So we can explore that as we uh, enter our next fiscal year. Great, great. And, and, and just a last question before I motion to su uh, support the item. Uh, uh, I saw it here, shoot, I'm so sorry. Um, super great, uh, the youth priorities, general neutral bathrooms, that's great. Um, you know, paid leave for city employees. I know we've all, we've all had uh, those conversations. Uh, flashing lights at pedestrian crossings, good job. That's important, <laughs> especially in front of our, in front of our schools. Uh, shucks, I had it right here. Oh, here it is. Um, just a quick, uh, the work plan, is it gonna include working with our San Jose Yeah or um, BEST uh, program and summer, Safe Summer Initiative? Is that gonna be included in there? Uh, so what we, we hope to align the work plan a little bit closer alongside the NSC work plan next year. Um, in the next NSC meeting, the library will have recommendations going forward basically through with the, because of the Youth Commission, that explore kind of enhancing the Youth Commission's role in local government and, um, and their advisory and recommendation capacity and working, uh, aligning our work plan to be closer with NSC's work plan and City Council Horizon Reports is, is what we look to do in the next fiscal year. Great, um, maybe I should ask a, a little bit more clear. Does our Youth Commission work with our San Jose Yeah or BEST programs or safe summer initiative? Button. Um, I am not aware that in the past year that there's been a, a close integration, but it's certainly something that we could we could um, pursue in the next year of work plan. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. And, and I was gonna also, Megan actually uh, said what I was gonna say, which is that one of the great things this Youth Commission has done has explored um, recommendations for this committee for next month um, about formalizing their role a little bit more so as Megan said it is more aligned but what that means is that when you receive recommendations that anything that has to do with youth uh, you will also hopefully receive um, their input at the same time and so um, so I think a closer alignment of all those programs would really be um, in order and um, so again you'll hear more about it next month um, at, the, at our next meeting. Great, and uh, before I motion, I also want to congratulate uh, Commissioner Conferr for getting uh, uh, accepted to 
wherever you got accepted to. So I just followed you guys on, on Snapchat. So I mean on Instagram. Sorry. Uh, but I motion to support uh, item uh, D4. Second. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Candelas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I too want to say thank you to the commission um, and the, the presentation. It was uh, very well very, very well presented and very articulate. So I, kudos. Um, I, um, I especially want to shout out uh, my commissioner, Gonzalez Muñiz, uh, who's sitting in the back trying to hide. I got you. I recorded you, so you're good. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've had the privilege of working with, with my youth commissioner, actually with several events in my district, from cleanups to food distribution. Um, uh, so, so kudos. Um, thank you for what you do for our community. Uh, volunteering your time and uh, and uh, yeah, I just I just wanted to you know give you give you a shout out. So I appreciate you and and, and the commission as a whole. But um, yeah, I, I look forward to um, to seeing uh, the recommendations that you m bring forward to us and how we can collaborate. Whether it's on uh, litter pickups, um, you know, budget budget and breakfast events, you name it, uh, uh, we're here to support. So thank you. Great, Councilmember Ortiz. I just really want to congratulate uh, the Youth Commission for all their hard work. It's really impressive to see you all sit there in that box and present to um, our committee. That's definitely what I was uh, that not what I was doing when you're, I was your age. So really uh, proud of, uh, of all of you. It takes a lot of confidence uh, to sit there and present and just do the work uh, that you you do. Also, of course, I want to shout out my commissioner Andrew. We've done. Uh, a few, uh, you know, actions, whether it was an interview or I think we did um, a youth summit uh, together. Um, but, you know, I really support this uh, uh, commission or committee and anything I could do to support you guys in the future, do not uh, hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Juwan. Thank you, Vi. I mean, thank you, Chair. Um, great presentation. Thank you for volunteerism. Thank you for being the leadership. I would imagine you guys inspire and empower other youth to do civic duties. But the only suggestion I, uh, I have is that perhaps one of your items is to get a lot of uh, mentorship from many different companies, um, you know, uh, from the very small mom and pop to the, the big corporation. Um, so that way we can get, you know, the news to understand what it is to be in a professional uh, career or even a, um, being an electrician or a plumber. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think it's important that um, you guys be able to reach out to the corporation. And I would imagine they'd be very, very supportive of uh, your program. Thank you. Thank you. We're ready for the vote. That passes unanimously. All right, we will move on back to item D3. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. And our next item is the Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services Volunteer Management Program's annual report. And we've got quite the group coming down. Avi, are you going to lead it off? Okay. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Um, while our team is, is uh, filing down into the box, I'll just open up that we are, my, my name is Avi Tom. I'm Deputy Director of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services, joined by an incredible team here today to share something that we're very proud of, which is our volunteer management programs and accomplishments. Really, we're, we're here to brag a little bit about what, we're, what we've done, especially coming out of the pandemic when many volunteer programs uh, pulled back a little bit and what our plans are for the future to take it to another level. With that, I'd like to introduce our multidisciplinary team from the Parks Division, Division Manager Tori O'Reilly and Program Manager Leticia Spino. From Community Services uh, Community uh, Division, we have Community Services Supervisors Sochi Montes and Hilda Morales. And from the Recreation Division, we have Recreation Superintendent Jeremy Schopner. 
with that, I will turn it over to Tori Arelli. Thank you so much, Avi. Um, thank you, Chair Davis and council members for having us here today. As Avi said, we are super excited to present this. Um, so we're, pre today, we're here today to present the annual report which encompasses all volunteer opportunities within PRNS. Volunteers are utilized according to their skills and contribute thousands of hours of time each year working at community centers, city parks, city trails, and in the community engaging residents. The city of San Jose has a rich history of volunteerism. Much of this happens under the umbrella of um, Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services. Volunteers assist our city in various ways and come to PRNS through our Community Services Division, Recreation Division, and the Parks Division. Each of these program areas serve a different need in the community and serve to improve the quality of life for our residents overall. Next slide. All right, so this next slide looks like an org chart and it kind of is. So this reflects our current volunteer structure within PRNS. As you can see, the department offers a wide range of volunteer opportunities through all our divisions. The department's volunteer management unit, um, led by Leticia Espino, is responsible for supporting all volunteer activities across the different department divisions. The unit works closely with each division to identify volunteer needs and opportunities, assist in recruiting and training volunteers, and provide ongoing support and organizing recognition. The unit works to engage and support volunteers in various programs and activities which all support the department's mission. This chart, however, is not a hierarchy like an org chart would be, um, but provides an infrastructure to facilitate coordination between all programs which support each other in providing opportunities for the citizens of San Jose. Next slide. Okay, so volunteer hours add up. As you'll see from this chart, and I won't go into the detail of the numbers, um, there's a whole lot of volunteer hours and they have a dollar value and so volunteers bring a huge economic impact to our department. It provides, this table provides a summary of volunteer hours and the value of contributions in 2020-21 and 2020, 2021 22 As shown, the department's supported volunteerism increased dramatically in 2021-22 as more community members felt comfortable resuming volunteer activities with improving public health commission conditions. The overall value of the work these volunteers clearly makes an impact to the department and helps us to continue to grow. All right, so our volunteer service is aligned with the guiding principles of Activate San Jose, the department's 20 year strategic plan. I think many of you have seen the chart above which shows the Healthy Places Index in various areas of the city. All divisions currently use this Healthy Places Index scoring or HPI system to emphasize the importance of equity and use it as a tool in volunteer planning. The department also intends to coordinate and work closely with council offices on our planning efforts to make sure that we're reaching those most in need of our support. So now I'm going to turn it over to Leticia oh, Espino, our um, program manager for volunteer unit. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, everyone, for having us here today. So. The department offers two main options for individuals or groups who want to volunteer to help steward the city's parks. That's one day events and adopt a park uh, program. 
for t the year 21-22, we had over 6,673 volunteers engage in volunteering out at our parks and trails. 32,203 hours of hard work and service provided to the city of San Jose at over 179 park locations. The program is adaptable to all abilities and modifications can be made to ensure that everyone has a role to play. The goals of this program are to assist with various projects and help implement special projects such as native gardens, implementations, while fostering a sense of community and civic engagement. Next slide, please. This graph shows the number of one-day events in parks in 2019 and 2022 by HPI. As you can see in 2019, only 33% of volunteer events were held in a park that had an HPI percentile of 50 or less. By 2022, however, 55% of events were held in a park that had a HPI percentile of 50 or less. Next slide, please. Now, moving into Adopt a Park program, which is a longer term commitment uh, volunteer opportunity that involves adopting a specific park and taking responsibility for some of its stewardship and improvement. Adopt a Park volunteers are provided with training, tools, and support from the volunteer management unit. Currently, we have 86 of 210 city parks that have been adopted, which the department hopes to increase in 2023. The bar chart here shows the percentage, excuse me, percentage of parks that are adopted by HPI. We are aware of the disparity in parks adopted, but working on collaborative partnerships, targeted community engagement to increase our park adoptions. Moving on to my colleague, Sochi Montes, Community Service Supervisor, to give you an update on community service events. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Council Members. My name is Sochi Montes. I'm the Community Services Supervisor overseeing the Neighborhood Litter Program under Beautify SJ. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to highlight the successes of the Community Services Division's volunteer efforts. Our efforts help lead San Jose communities to feel safe, clean, and engaged. Additionally, I would like to thank the amazing effort from the Neighborhood Litter Program, um, led by Anthony Gonzalez and his staff, Luz Juarez, Anthony, Anthony Martinez, John Silva, and Julian Marmolejo, for the amazing work they do each day with our amazing volunteers. The Community Services Division volunteers, in total, have completed 18,471 hours of beautification efforts within their communities. Next slide. The Neighborhood Litter Program under Beautify SJ has hosted over 900 events with over 4,000 volunteers, and those same volunteers have completed nearly 16,000 of combined, 16,000 hours, excuse me, of combined efforts through our school events, community groups, neighborhood association, and our creek partners. They have managed to collect 500 52,500 pounds of trash. That is over 321 tons of debris from our communities and waterways. Uh, next, I would like to introduce my colleague, Ila Morales, who will speak on Project Hope efforts. Thank you, Sochil. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Hilda Morales, and I'm the Community Services Supervisor for the City of San Jose's Project Hope. Project Hope is a resident engagement and empowerment effort that provides backbone support to nine neighborhood associations within the city. The 2,507 volunteer hours highlighted for Project Hope reflect various community efforts such as community events, dumpster days, resource fairs, and neighborhood association and planning meetings. These courageous board members and volunteers who support their neighborhood association often juggle multiple jobs, personal responsibilities, and many times personal hardships. Yet, all the board members and volunteers have demonstrated a great deal of commitment and responsibility to ensure that the lives and the lives of their families and neighbors improve. These events hosted by the neighborhood associations have been utilized as a way to engage the community by making the connection between the residents and the various city departments and resources. 
but most importantly, these efforts have served as a way to give residents a voice and a sense of hope. There are not enough words to express the sincere gratitude that I feel towards each of our volunteers for one, trusting our Project HOPE staff, but for tirelessly working to make sure that our San Jose is a better place to live. At this time, I'd like to thank you for your time and introduce Jeremy Schaffner. Thank you, Hilda. Good afternoon, Chairperson Davis, NSC committee members, city manager's office and general public, Jeremy Schaffner, recreation superintendent with the PRNS Recreation Division. I'm here to highlight our Recreation Division volunteer programs within our senior services and community centers. Volunteers continue to be a critical part of our services, supporting safe and high quality programs. Next slide, please. With our senior services program, we have 13 program sites with 167 volunteers that assisted us during COVID, but continue as we progress in post pandemic operations. These volunteers provided 2,352 volunteer hours that assisted with the following programs, senior nutrition program, bringing back our senior classes and fitness programs such as art classes and Tai Chi, special events including holiday celebrations, events like our Lunar New Year celebrations and moon festivals at most of our centers, along with food distribution. Next slide, please. Pyrenees continues to operate 13 community centers, including 10 main hub sites and three outreach sites. These sites were successful because of 6,926 volunteer hours provided by our residents and participants. These volunteers supported our programs, including Gen to Gen programs, events with our youth and adults, including the Mayfair Community Center's Fall Blast Intergenerational Dance, had to get that one out without a tongue twister, with their older adults and teens from the youth center. Almaden, Berryessa, and Roosevelt Community Centers have been doing events with preschoolers and our older adults as well. Volunteers are supporting with special events such as dance socials and monthly celebrations and other recreational activities at all of our community centers. Thank you, and I'll now turn the presentation back to Tori. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, so next steps, what are we looking to? As you've heard today, we have many, many wonderful volunteer opportunities, but with any great program, there's always room for improvement. So for the future year, we're looking at streamlining our efforts with more coordination to make volunteering a little bit easier. We're also working on improving our community outreach and engagement to make all volunteers feel welcome regardless of where they are in life and to reach out to untapped volunteer resources. We want to work to remove barriers to volunteering including childcare, transportation, the date and time of volunteer activities and opportunities. We wanna provide diversity and inclusion training for our volunteers to address unconscious biases. And lastly, we wanna form collaborative partnerships which will allow us to build more interest and involvement as we work with the divisions as well as outside agencies like local food vendors, community-based organizations, San Jose State University, and more. I wanna thank all of our presenters today. Without them, we wouldn't have such amazing programs. And I wanna say that each volunteer we have truly becomes part of our PRNS family and allows us to continue to do the amazing things we do. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time listening to us today and ask, please accept our annual volunteer program report and we are open to any questions. Great, thank you. And I wanna thank you, uh, Leticia, especially you and your team um, and, and all of PRNS for everything you do to improve the, um, and increase the participation of, of our volunteers. It's especially changed over the last few years and at least in my district and um, it's been great to see how many I can't even keep up with all of the events that you do <laughs> um, all over the city so it's really great and I very much appreciate it we'll go to public comment 
Pa? Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. These are excellent programs. Um, they're nothing new to the Chicano community. The Chicano community um, for, for uh, generations has had this point of, of, of community and connection and 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 exchange the, these types of events in the chicano community were functioned as a means for the community to come together and exchange information and it, the hub of it was uh, uh, Guadalupe Church on the east side, and it was Sacred Heart Church on the west side in the horseshoe. And so the Catholicism was very much involved in creating that sense of community and connection. And then, you know, of course, it branched out because we were a very extremely racialized, segregated community. And I think I think we really need to examine how we talk about the that statistic that you used, the healthy or the HPI, because when you look at that <clears throat> map, what we're looking at in our face is a very clear articulation of how the segregated neighborhoods created these unhealthy neighborhoods. The, it, it's not an accident that that map is created that way. And we really have to be conscious of that, you know, very cognizant of that, because it, it, we're, we're, we're looking at evidence of how racism is a public health issue and needs to be addressed as such. And you have it right there in that map. But you wouldn't think so because of the way that you talk about it. Oh, this is, this is, this is the healthier part of town. Thus, you're erasing the racist policies that actually created it in the first place. So we really need to be careful on how we talk about that. I don't, like I said, I'm not calling out anybody in particular. What I'm calling out is the system and the way that we engage it and talk about it. I'd like to know why um, equity training is necessary in this particular department. Back to the committee. Thank you, Councilmember Torres. Good afternoon, thank you so much. Some familiar faces. Hi, uh, Sochi. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, incredible work you all do. Uh, I, I, I've gone to these events not only as a as a you know a candidate, but also now as a as a council member. So it's 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 always great to for our pre RNS to to work with other folks to help improve our parks. Um, so thank you for all that you do. Uh, it's, it's an incredible work, and it's always important to make sure that we have beautiful parks across our city, right? And so um, that's why I. I I, there are two areas of concern that I have, uh, so you know, not to be Debbie Downer here, uh, but um, our, our HPI percentile, obviously it's very concerning that uh, three, five, and seven, right, are still uh, at our lowest in our city, and I know you and our city and other partners are trying to, I don't know, lower that, eradicate that, I don't know, it's kind of a weird number. Erase it, I don't know. Uh, make it greener, pun intended. Uh, but um, uh, but so we all have to work together on that. So um, the other one is I did see that we've kind of made some movement on the adopt a park. Uh, the last presentation it was we were at a, a low 70s and now we're at 86 uh, parks out of 210. By the way, uh, we have 210 parks in the city of San Jose for all those you listening out there, uh, and only 86 have been adopted. That's a very very low number. Um, but like I mentioned, since the last time in February, that number has, has slightly gone up, which is great. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to hopefully do my part. So I'm going to have, have my team send out something to say, you know, adopt the park because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important that other uh, organizations are adopting our parks and creating beautiful parks with us. So um, with that, I motion to support item D3. Second. Second. Thank you. Council Member Dewan. Volunteerism is, is the core value and the fiber of our community. And I just want to say I'm grateful for every person out there who volunteers. Thank you. Short and sweet, I like it. Councilmember Candelas. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna try to be that short, but I don't, I don't think I can. But um, th thanks staff for the, for the program report. Um, a couple things. I, I, the Adopt a Park program. Count on me to be an ally on that. I, I know uh, folks in the Meadowfair neighborhood uh, want to adopt the the the, um, uh, the park, 
um, since we are doing a master plan and want to upgrade it. And, and, and I, I think I'm going to um, uh, lean in on your team to see if you can help us uh, coordinate with the neighborhood association so we can bring that up and, and hopefully increase that, that percentage that Council Member Torres alluded to. Um, and, um, and, and with regards to the, the, the events, I've been out there pulling weeds and I know, uh, I know those single day events are hard work and, and volunteering is tough, but you, you give us all the tools. And I mean, I know my back was sore just for, from pulling weeds for a couple hours. So I can only imagine uh, our, our tireless volunteers are going day, day in, day out. So, so big kudos. And, um, and however my office can be helpful, I know um, uh, you, held, uh, you, you helped with a, a dumpster day we did uh, in the neighborhood and, and, and got volunteers out. So uh, yeah, much appreciation. Keep up the great work. Thank you. All right, we're ready for the vote. All right, and that motion passes. Thank you all very much, appreciate it. We will move now to open forum. Paul? Oh, uh, yes. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe, speaking within the context of neighborhoods and, and parks and recreation, I am very troubled to see when I walked into the Vietnamese Museum at, uh, at the uh, History Park, what I was looking for was a reflection of myself, and I should absolutely see myself reflected in the Vietnamese Museum, because it was the Chicano community that made the freedom that the Vietnamese community experiences now possible. The Chicano Moratorium, which was not reflected in the Vietnamese Museum, was a very critical part of United States history. The Mexican community, Chicano community, comprised of over 20% of the casualties. Yet in Vietnam, which was the most of any other race, any other race, it was the Chicano communities in the United States that made the freedom that the Vietnamese community now enjoys, which means that we are the backbone of the Vietnamese community. It is because of our sacrifices, which 48 Chicanos are on that wall. And when I walk into the Vietnamese Museum, there is no reflection of our history, absolutely none. And so it's like, why is it that we are allowing these statues to be placed in that museum, which there was hundreds of thousands of dollars that was paid through, through Councilwoman Esparza to put these statues that are representations of war, but yet those statues did not go through the Arts Commission, and yet they are a part of, they're on city property. So why are we placing statues that uh, and allowing monies to be paid to, to uh, uh, council members and through History San Jose in order to establish museums that never went through the democratic process to determine what these statues represent because they certainly don't re represent the Chicano community. Back to the committee. Meeting is adjourned.